Thank you. So, with a different hat, I try to give a little bit of common ground for those of you who are not familiar with this area we call actually digital humanities. We can discuss this term uh, in length, but it's, it's not very helpful. Uh, but I think it's helpful to get a, an understanding what's behind many initiatives like Darwin Online, Newton Online, Heckel, uh, sorry if I call this Heckel Online, it's, it's a different name. And uh, about details, uh, Heiko Weber will continue. So you get a full picture and I have the opportunity to give a broader picture, start with a big picture. Well, Blumenbach is a typical uh, digital edition project. Well, we try to give a new edition of all Blumenbach's original works, which is a lot, even of the translation and the reissues. This wouldn't be done uh, before the digital age. It's just a collection or something uh, would uh, be done uh, in, le what, let me say, 20 years ago. Um, nowadays, it's no problem to have the full work in the sense that even reissues play a role. We have also the correspondence. Now, maybe we get the opportunity to have not only uh, the calendar of Blumbach's correspondence, but the correspondence itself is part of the whole thing. Uh, we try also to reconstruct the scientific collection, which means thousands of objects. Uh, Heiko will explain this later on. And, of course, we document um, the contemporary and later reception and try to link between the texts and the objects, because this is part of the modern way to do science. And, of course, bibliographical studies on Blumenbach, so give the whole uh, overview of his work, will also be done. So this is a very typical digital edition project which could be, couldn't be done before. But the idea behind is not a digital idea. It's a very old idea. And to give only one example, this is the Corpus Inscriptorum Latinarum, which starts in the 19th century with the, not a purpose to have a specific research question, but to offer for the whole, um, for the whole research community all the sources of the Roman Empire wherever we find these kinds of inscription. So you have not a specific uh, question and then do an addition just to give the material to the research community. This idea is a very old one, but as you see, it takes a lot of time, normally something like 100 years, uh, until it's finished. In digital age, we can do this in something like 20 years. This is an advantage. And today it's all digital, of course. So I will talk in, in two parts. The first about exactly what these digital editions are in general. And then uh, in the second part a little bit where we might go on in the next years because this field is changing very rapidly. So the idea of a digital edition is also an old idea. It starts in 1949 with this Jesuit prize, one of our heroes, uh, Father Buza. He convinced Thomas Watson, the founder of IBM, to run the edition of St. Thomas in a digital format, which at that time was, of course, punch cards. And he wants to solve a very simple problem. He wants to start a um, concordance around the word of presencia, presence, in the work of St. Thomas. And St. Thomas has written a lot, so it's not easy to get an overview of the whole thing. And a computer might be helpful. This was a genius idea to start this and do it with a computer. And today you find it, of course, uh, just go to the web and you can work with the whole work of St. Thomas, thanks to Father Boozer and his great team uh, more than half a century ago. Well, the basic idea behind all kinds of, all of these kinds of uh, digital editions is always the same. You have to translate analog objects, text, whatever it is, into a digital format. And this is not easy because there's no direct translation. There's no direct mapping. There's, it comes always to a cost and you have to reflect exactly this. So what we do is normally, especially with uh, texts, we have these wonderful scanners. Even here in the library, we have these robots. And of course, Google has millions of these robots who could uh, reproduce text very easily. And first you have an image. Image is just an image. Nobody could read it, but you can use OCR, which is optical character recognition, so a machine could somehow read these texts, which is a problem with black letters. German tradition is a bit difficult for them. Or you do it, or some have done it uh, with Grimm's uh, Wörterbuch, so the Grimm Dictionary. They let it type 
mostly in China or today in Vietnam, two people who can't read the text but only know the letter and type letter for letter and then you compare it and correct only th these uh, characters where there's a deviation between the two letters. And it works with the accuracy than more than 99%. So the Grimmsche Wörterbuch, if you go to the internet, it's really a perfect picture of the older uh, dictionary. Well, this is not easy. There are many problems with things like uh, these ligaturen and other things, but in the end, this is now very well established. Then writing means a difference in the digital age. Normally, if we have a typewriter and you want to type in something bold, though you know the old typewriters uh, hammer twice and then the letter is uh, bold. <coughs> well, a computer can't do that. So you have to tell the computer that you want a word bold to present it on a screen, something like that. And what you do is exactly you put in these tags, we call them. Yeah, you'll see these specific uh, P means a paragraph, B means bold, and if you use any website, this is all done in the end with this uh, machinery behind. Well, but today there is a markup language which tells the computer very much in detail what you want to do, what you want to show, what kind of structure of a text or an object we have. So this is of my area of studies, German literature. So what is the head? A computer can't understand what's the capital of a, of a text. If you tell him it's the head, die Leid des jungen Werters, the source of the young Werther, well, he understands. But without these texts, nobody could understand. it. And you could uh, differentiate all these texts very precisely downwards to many things like it's a letter or what kind of type it is in. And these markup languages, which HTML you use every day and on the web uh, sites, uh, is now uh, standardized by an initiative which is called the Text Encoding Initiative, which gives you plenty of opportunities to describe nearly every kind of text, every specific specificity of text, like who's the speaker in this drama, it's a drama of Goethe, uh, what's the line, L means line, Oh, he shouts out, Elmire, and then there's a specific thing, oh, what he's acting, the way he acts on the stage. This is type in take uh, uh, at this uh, stage thing. Er springt hervor, he jumps on the screen, or on the stage, something like that. So every part of um, the logic of a text could be somehow mapped by this uh, annotation language. Uh, and this is well established as an international organization uh, overlapping with the World uh, W3 Consortium uh, through Spurback McQueen. And this is established and so well established that even my colleagues in music now start a music encoding initiative. So how could we describe a score? So exactly here, this is part of Beethoven's uh, joy of uh, what's this huge, yeah, the, the Ninth Symphony, yeah. So uh, every, oh, yeah, okay. Uh, for, for every note, you have a specific description. It's exactly on this scale. It's this uh, duration of the note. It's played by this instrument and so on. Every detail. And then you can compare things and find patterns in music, which is on a completely new way to do this. So these kinds of standardization to run digital editions is now more and more established worldwide. It's only possible to do it on a worldwide scale because if you have any idiosyncratic solution, it couldn't be read by the next computers around the corner. Yeah. So in Blumenbach, we have exactly this uh, problem. We try to integrate in one front end and maybe in the next months, I don't know exactly, the new website will be uh, published. Uh, Heiko will talk more about this. But the problem is here, and this is maybe the unique thing here, we have not only text, but we have also skulls, we have minerals, we have pictures, and we have little objects from the pocket bean and, and other things. And to bring all this together and in, link it in a sensible way is not easy. So if you find a passage writing about this mineral and you want to go look exactly to the object where Blumenbach is talking about and looking on the uh, uh, inscription about this, so you can do that and you can um, correct it maybe also if there are uh, uh, flaws into it. 
Well, the idea is, again, we have this image scan at the beginning, then we have a transcription of the whole text, then we uh, combine it with the image scan, here the Bildschöner Schädel einer Georgerin, so the wow, pictural, beautiful uh, skull of the Georgian uh, woman, and you have the 3D object, and go from one to the other direction, this is exactly what we have to do. You need, and this is very part of the uh, critical thing, you need metadata, because otherwise you don't know, well, this is an image, well, who has done this image, from what, who's the author, what is exactly the creator of that, is the author the real author, so we have many documents, maybe not in Blumenbach, but in other digital editions, where a name is written onto it, but it's not the author. I think especially of female writers in 18th century, it's often not published under their name. Or the publishing house is not the real publishing house. Think about Pierre Marteau, who published more than three, I think two or three hundred years in Cologne. Of course, he never <laughs> existed. It's just helpful to publish things and to say it's a video format or whatever this edition. So metadata are essential to bring these sources together and make the text critical readable. So metadata is so, so important and we all know now by NSA why it is very helpful. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you get a long list, so describe a skull like this, uh, I will uh, this explain in, in detail, is a long list. We have formulas where you put type in these things uh, to get a full picture of all these things here, and you get long list, even exactly the geographical data where this skull was found, uh, who is the, found, um, the, the person, the provenance of this, who afterwards alter the skull or a mineral or whatever it is. So they have a long history. It's not just a collection, it's not a finished uh, story, and all this is described here also. So you get things like that, and you can zoom in and so on things like that. You see here even the fund, court, uh, fund uh, coordinaten, so many little details, but this is part of a critical edition today. And the same is true with uh, minerals here, and of course science plays a role. Who could decide what kind uh, of mineral we have here exactly, and what's the age of this object or something like that. And we are not able as editors to do this. We need the scientists to help us here. Well, to come to an end with this first part, I would call this a close reading, so in the broad sense, but in a digital sense, and the machines could help us to do what we already do with historical methods, with humanitical uh, methods, but with a better resolution. The first is we could not only edit the canon, we could edit the whole Blumenbach or the whole Newton or whatever it is, the whole Darwin, so the diaries of Emma Darwin, this is no problem to do all of this. Um, it makes it much easier accessible. So think about uh, the Darwin Online project, which is so important because you know that in many countries it's not allowed to uh, read about Darwin in schools, like in Turkey or other countries with problems about this. So the internet plays really a role in this sense of enlightenment. This is really enlightenment of the world. So make your own picture about Blumenbach or Darwin or Newton, whatever things like that. Um, well, even unknown and unprintable parts of the culture, cultural heritage are now readable, somehow, much more than before. And we can connect it. Europeana is only one of these typical new initiatives. Uh, Europeana is not a library in the sense we like here. This, it's a meta crawler. So it collects uh, from all parts of Europe, collection, all kinds of uh, collections, so posters, text, music, scores, all kinds of things, but it's only, uh, in the end, a link machine where you go through the large uh, parts of the European cultural heritage. A worldwide digital library is in planning stage, I would say, well, it's, it's not uh, flourishing like the Europeana. But this is only possible if we share uh, standards. Without these standards, it's not possible. So it's a worldwide community doing exactly this. So I came to my second point. Maybe this, this is all well established. We can do that on a very high level and Blumenbach Online is a good example from that. But maybe we can go further. So if we go to the Deutsche Textarchiv where Blumenbach is supporting a lot thanks to Heiko Weber and others, you can check these with regular expressions and with queries. So I 
Uh, you can't write it. It's a very complicated uh, way to search in these with specific languages. Uh, and then you get all the expression where Rasse is uh, combined with specific adjectives. So specific things like Malaysia Rasse, ähnliche Rasse, verschiedene Rasse, different Rasse, uh, original race, and things like that. So these kinds of combination you can search on a very intelligent way. It's more than a string. A string is just uh, a letter and a letter and a letter. Here it's much more. You can look for specific type of words, the grammatical types and the combination of these grammatical types. And you already can check this out and you find many thoughts. That isn't, it's not a large archive, it's about 1,500 uh, works. This is not a lot, but a lot if you want to do research on the um, inventing of uh, racism in 19th century. You find a lot of sources and you get out of that digital da uh, uh, statistical data and you see uh, during the 19th century, this is here 1800, it's going up. Don't worry about the up and downs. This is only part to the uh, works which are in this archive. It's, it's a too small group, but you see the increasing uh, topic of uh, specific phrases uh, around race things like that. So combine all these additions in new aggregated forms like the Deutsche Textarchiv is a typical way to do more out of it. And if you compare to the Google and Gram view, I, I hope everybody's familiar with things like that, uh, if you can map now with the new uh, 3.0 uh, version uh, the French uh, sources and the German sources. And this is what I've done here. This is the German uh, corpus and the French corpus, and compare Rasse and Rasse in different writings. Uh, Varietät, you see the, the Blumenbach term here, this, the green line down, and you see that uh, uh, Rasse is, of course, much more used in the French context because it's also used for dogs, uh, horses, and nobility. This is the three major <laughs> things. Yeah, if you're a family of value, uh, in the French sense, in 18th century, you have a specific race. So things like that, you can compare, and the, the corpus here behind of Engram Fuhr, the whole Engram Fuhr is about five million uh, items, books, while well, here behind is something like one and five, one and a half million books behind. Do things like that. It's in the end, combine these additions to larger corpora and looking for cultural trends, looking for patterns in it. Or if I look the same, I'm looking for the word Rasse in, well, it's only for 20th century in, in one of the best balanced uh, German uh, language dictionaries collection. And you can see that we have different um, type. Oh, sorry. So, uh, yeah, it's that. No, that's not working. Um, so, different belletistic uh, journals, um, scientific writings, and everyday all kinds of. Uh, used literature, and you can see that at the beginning, around 1900, it's, it's going down, it's going up in the uh, Nazi area, and you find it also in newspapers, here in the green part of it, and in Wissenschaft, but even here, this, and you find this a balanced corpus of, of different uh, types, and again, you connect different uh, corpora into one, um, uh, different editions into one corpora and then looking for patterns. Like, is a specific word or uh, phrase more used in scientific writing than in newspapers or the other way around, or more used in literature than in non-literature and things like that. So this is starting more and more uh, becoming better and better. Well, though I would call this the million book situation, which is Something, Google claims there might be 130 million books ever printed. I would say the number is too small. I think uh, all think will know better. Something maybe like 250 million books ever printed in the world. But think about now more than nearly 30 millions of them are digitized by Google. And if you look at Evans, Gallica, and all these editions, more and more really large corpora, big data, of cultural resources are available, and we can make more sense about it. This is called, with a term uh, by Stanford comparatist Franco Moretti, distant reading, which is without a single direct textual reading, you can't read a million books. During lifetime, we manage something like 4,000, 5,000 books. Wow, 
maybe more. If you do nothing, then reading. But normally, you can't do more, but not a million. It's absolutely impossible. With machines, we can do that. And there are many methods to do this. And the major point, uh, point behind is formalization, which is not an easy thing. So go back to the 50s, where archaeologists start to do modern digital archaeology. What they do is how to describe a vessel. So a vessel could be different forms, but it's not endless the way how a vessel is shaped. So it must be open. It could be so, something like that. It could be like something like that, like something like that, but it's limited. So they try to classify every part if uh, they, they uh, cut it into pieces and say, well, the opening part is looking like that. There could be four or five uh, ways how it looks like, then the middle part and then the bottom part and things like that. So you cut the problem into single steps, which is in the end a kind of an algorithm. And this is exactly what you do. And this is also a very old idea. It's coming from 19th century. Don't forget this. So uh, if you look into the Shakespeare uh, research, who has written Shakespeare play, well, mathematicians like Mendelhall uh, try to look on the length of the sentence how long, longer words or shorter words are used, the number of syllables used, and things like that helps us to identify exactly that. And this is the same done by Morgan or by Ludoslavsky in Poland, so in diff many parts of the 19th century, they try to find out, well, who has written some Paul's letters. Well, let's look on the word slangs measured in syllables. So you cut a problem down to a formalistic, very precise, a descriptable uh, problem, the number of syllables. Right. It works. So i uh, give you a more advanced uh, view. You have a text, a very simple text. It has only two words in this text to make things simple. Well, only the word before and liné. Well, this is not a very interesting uh, text. And we have two chapters of this text. Well, the first chapter has uh, b the word before three times and the word liné only one times. And the chapter two is very interesting, has two times before and Linné four times. Now, if you formalize the whole thing in a mathematical way, you do the following. You say, well, the first chapter, you see, before three times, and, uh, yeah, and Linné only one time, so you get a vector of this length, here's one, here's three, and then you do the same for the second chapter, and then you could compare it in a mathematical way, just measure the delta, which is cosinus in the end here. This is a basic idea where how you compare text which seems to be, you do not looking for the content, you just step into it in a formalistic uh, way. Another thing is we use uh, words in a specific um, frequency and you can describe them in a law which is called the Zipf law. Well, specific. You, on the one hand, you have the most used words, and then it's going down to the words which are only used once, and you get a curve like that, and if you compare it like a novel written by Fontana, which is the German uh, Anna Karenina, you get nearly, so the blue line here, nearly the same line, so some words, especially articles and things like that, are used very frequently, and many words are only used once. So you can describe and get specific curves and compare texts like this or you check uh, the number of word types, so how many words are used, how long they are. And you know that Agatha Christie um, suffered under Alzheimer's disease, and over the time of their novel, it's just uh, the novel and you see the age of composition, she's uh, using more and more uh, less words, so the number of word types is going down uh, due to Alzheimer, and she uses more uh, indefinite, indif indefinite words and actors like that. So you can describe and, and see even personal traits in writing. You can't control it, it's subliminal, and it's things like that. <coughs> Other uh, looking like the very famous uh, Burris Delta, that's a cluster analysis where you exclude, well, think about the meaningful words. You're not looking for the most prominent thing. You're looking just for formalizing counting words. So uh, John Burr is looking for the relative frequency of the first 150 most frequency words, words and try to detect whether he could distinguish between the different writers of uh, 70th century long poems. 
Is that possible? Well, he organized this a long story. Uh, to make it very short, I take only one. It's called uh, back of words technology. You have just really a back. You put the first here in this, the uh, 45 words to the domain, principal referential markers, words like the, a, uh, to, his, is, and so on. And according to this le, uh, word list, you get a dentogram, which you know maybe from biology. And in this dentogram, he could distinguish completely autom automatized uh, the genre of the writing. So poems, plays are different, and things like that. And you can detect, it's, it's not like a fingerprint, but it works uh, even to detect uh, authors. Well, we use uh, this in my field here, where the computer could distinguish between Enlightenment writing and 19th century writing. So here is the group of 18th century writing, and down it's 19th century writing, and you get a dendrogram like in biology. And we can do this only by most frequency words. It's, we're not looking into the content. It's working now. Or here, could the computer find out whether it's written by a female or male author? Well, in 19th century, there's nothing said to 20th century writers, 19th century. Well, normally, boys and girls uh, are in separate rooms. Well, with some interesting uh, outliners. So uh, Dorothea Schlegel, she writes like uh, male writers. So we have in 19th century, especially female writers who imitate Goethe. And this is why they cluster to this group. Things like that, or my friend Jamie Tirani from Durham uh, tried to get a map of all the fairy tales according to the formalism of the Arne Thompson Index, where the classification of all the fairy tales, and try to find for here's a little riding hood and try to find out how these uh, um, fairy tales group together, and you find clearly uh, cultural groups like East Asian, uh, African types, and here. Peru and Krim are very close together, the European tradition. So specific. It's all adopted from biology now. Split trees is a, a technique from biology. Or you can look into sentiments. So we want to know how a specific term, a specific concept is evaluated in large groups of uh, uh, corpora. So you classify the one words are more positive, here in the term, good, schön, so beautiful, well, good, uh, right, uh, luckily, and things like that. And uh, then you have an opposite back of words, and then the computer try to classify the thing. Of course, irony is not catched. Eine schöne Bescherung doesn't work. Well, if you're looking in millions of books, it doesn't matter so much. No. Here's just an example, very famous theory in psychology. Uh, is the Pollyanna hypothesis, uh, which tells us that we try to be friendly. So I try not to be too rude to you while talking to you, and this is what we do most of the time. And they have a corpus of Twitter, of books, uh, according to New York Times um, book catalog, then New York Times itself, and then music lyric of modern times. And the yellow one shows you the more positive words. And you see, oh, even in Twitter, where we all uh, blame about all the problems that people are unfriendly in Twitter, most of the time, most people are very friendly. The same is in books, the same as New York Times. But in music lyrics, well, I'm so sad, well, you know, things like that. So more negative feelings have a place in things like that. And you can detect it uh, in these manners. So I come now uh, to an end. I think the history of science and the digital age could benefit a lot from these new uh, ways. First, we can unlock the canon, not only look on few, the big names, as we do, of course, in, in the former times, Blumenbach itself, and counter the cultural heritage in an unknown white and death. Well, the second thing is maybe we are looking more on a cultural evolution well, I don't know whether this is an opposite of history, but somehow, because history is limited normally to a more narrow window into uh, the material, now we can look really on large-scale big data, looking for long-term uh, differences and uh, yeah, well, developments in, in the cultural um, age. 
And of course, we can, we should do all these additions. I think should build, become part of corpora, which means we have them to prepare in a way that they could use for different research questions in new corpora. This is not a fixed corpora. Corpora are built according to a specific research questions. And on these corpora, then, we can use uh, methods like the most frequency words, topic modeling, where you try to automatize, detect the topics which are changing over time, and sentiment analysis, which I showed you, things like that. So the hope is that we can answer old questions in a better way and maybe pose new questions. And one last thing here is the improvement of scholarly rel uh, reliability. Well, uh, different, difficult word. Uh, because normally in, in, in scholarship, it's hard uh, to control things. Here, the more you formalize the whole thing, the more you can control and see whether good data, really well done or not done. So this is, might be helpful also for this. Well, that's it. Thank you.